The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Dodgy Dave's got a new um, jacuzzi out here. I, know, I never know the names of these people. I'm just they're all it's Dodgy Dave. It's DIY Dave. DIY Dave, not Dodgy Dave. Sorry, Dave, some oh. some of these chaps listen as well, don't they? DIY Dave. DIY Dave. Yeah, good mate. He's got. Yeah. A, a, it's not a jacuzzi. What's he got then? A jacuzzi is a brand name. Oh, is it? Understand the difference between a oh, hot just, tub, right, and a jacuzzi. That's like calling a Dyson a Hoover. Oh, I never knew that. I thought yeah. it was just generally. I thought a thing with bubbles in that you you go in with your your mates and worry where your feet are. It's nope. just called a jacuzzi. No, nope. it's actually the the second. They talk about this on the second point on the twenty two immutable laws of branding. Do they? Yes. Is it really? Yes. Don't that, outbrand yourself. Hoover must be in there as well. Surely. Well, Hoover, Coca Cola. Yeah, they're all there because how many people ask for a Coke when they get a Pepsi? There's not Pepsi. I oh, know it's Pepsi Cola, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's not yeah, Coca Cola. There, no, there is no other Coke, is there? Jacuzzi is a brand, and actually, the Jacuzzi as a brand went out of business because they they basically became so synonymous with did the they, product. Did they sink themselves? They sunk themselves <laughs> in a well, bubbling hot funny. bath of water. Yeah. 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 So DIY Dave's got a uh, so he's got, got a hot tub, lovely hot tub. Oh, yeah. Right. So I might. Uh, you can't. Are you, are you allowed to go there. in the hot tub, though? I mean, you're allowed to go in swimming pools now, aren't I'm you? I'm not going to go in with anybody else. No, I won't let DIY Dave get in there. I'll just get in myself. Just well, why not DIY? My... What's the matter with D- DIY Dave? Is it is it a bit grubby or no, what? no, no, not at all? But I, I don't, I don't like sharing. <laughs> it's, like, it's like hot tubs and pizzas. Well, That's... thanks very much, Dave. You've you've brought us round, but pop out your hot tub. I don't like sharing. I want the whole thing to myself. You can sit over there. Filter the first, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. How many people are going round to this hot tub thing? Uh, well, it would be less than six because that's all we're allowed. Yeah. In the old days, would all the less than six have got into the um, into the hot tub? We, all, you, all you chaps, would we you? won't. I, I tell you, we definitely in won't the be, old days. In the, in the old days, yeah. Would yeah. you all have got in? Would you all have jumped in? Not that one because it's not big enough. But right. I would have no problems getting in a hot tub with other men. No, I'm not suggest. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm oh, just thinking. 2020. Yeah, I know. The, the, this, <laughs> I've always thought felt, felt hot tubs were a little bit. You know, where where are your feet? <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what are you doing? Uh, no, no, no. I, um, I, I, you, Gemma will tell you. I absolutely. Love I know you hot love tubs. your hot tubs, don't you? Although I do, I don't. They don't really f- fill me with the thought of joy in the summer. I have to say, it's no. more of a winter thing. For me. Oh no, dear. Well, there was one though in the ski resort we uh, were in, and they had one just outside. You went, you went out the swimming pool, one outside, yeah. and then the hot tub bit was outside, oh. which is perfect with the snow coming yeah. down. Absolutely, and that, that's a proper romantic hot tub, isn't it? The Fuji cast. Yeah. Oh, look, I'll, I'll just uh, strike one up in the corner here. Would you? Look, should we do the show from the hot tub? <laughs> we'll make something else then. <laughs> <laughs> right, welcome to uh, the Fuji cast. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag, and of course now also through the Fuji cast private Facebook group that you're very welcome to become a part of. If you want to send an old-fashioned mail, though, send to click at fujicast.co.uk. Do you think in all the time? No, we. No, we've never had an address, but in all the time we've done this show, have we ever had an old, old-fashioned letter? No. Um, Don't think we have, have we? We've had a couple of things sent, like gifty-like things. Yeah. Um, we love gifty We things. love gifts. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. love Sending gifts. Sending your gifts. Especially ones that need a bottle top to open. <laughs> Yes. Bottle opener to open. Yeah. Um, <laughs> welcome aboard those who don't shoot Fuji. You're very welcome here. And as you'll, you'll find as you listen on that we talk about all kinds of stuff that don't don't necessarily have a brand badge. And of course, you've just become part of that friendly club. We'll take you to Club Indulgence, which is our way of, um, of trying to read off um, the, the nice comments that you make on the, the reviews uh, without being... You know, we can be a little bit British and self-derogatory about the whole thing, but they are very, very important to us. And thank you very much for, for leaving them. There's Kev's Book of the Week. Last week, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if you're going to be able to top last week because last week's title was the most amazing title. What, what if, what last you... week, remember, we had Sylvia Plasci and it was called Self-Portraits with Cows Going Home. Yeah, that was brilliant. Um, with what going home? Cows. I knew I had the sound effect somewhere. And do you remember where I said I bought it from? Yes, it was in Chelsea, wasn't it? At the end of, uh, was it at the end of King's Road? At the end of the world or something? <laughs> or what was it? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> oh, it's making me laugh. It was at the end of the world or something. Yeah. It was at the World's End. World's End. End World's End is is actually a real place. World's End. Uh, it's a funny little, great little place. Yeah. And uh, today, well, I, was, I was close. You were close. It's not bad memory. I was just for a laughing week. at watching you struggle through yeah, that end of the world. Um, so today's book is a self-published book right. by Alan Lebois. Alan right. Lebois is. Um, 
and, and the reason why it reminded me of the edge of the world uh, sorry, uh, end the, of the world end of the world end of the pier is because this book <laughs> is called at the end, edge of the world oh right okay and this is all portraits is that fam- another place in Chelsea family family snaps so Alan Laboile will talk about it oh, these are family snaps yeah 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 so he's that beautiful family photographer who um, documented his entire family's life. Oh, um, wow. And I, I bought this directly from him, so I, I have no idea whether you can get it, but I'm going to talk about it. You bought it from him? Well, I bought it from his website. Oh, oh right. I thought yeah. you meant you sort of saw, saw him. And, no, 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 no. Uh, and he, he was like, uh, Kev, do you want to buy a book? No, no. <laughs> you can uh, be my friend. I did have some, uh, look at the coffee stain on that. Oh, but that, see, to me, that makes it... No, more, more terrible. S- well, no, actually, I'm I'm trying to make you feel better, but that that actually no, that doesn't look good. Terrible Muriel. Who did that? Was that the dog? No, this is I had this book years and years, way before yeah. dogs. Can't blame them. You for always this. look after your books so immaculately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who was it recently? I saw. Oh, I know. I tell you who it was. It was Jim Mortram, who um, he put a post up on Twitter, and his dog had bitten into. Now, who was it? I think it was a Salgado book. Mm. I think. He'd had a proper chew. <laughs> I, I've got a Peter Dench book that's been chewed up oh, by, by Monty. Monty. Yeah. Monty. Naughty. There you go. Inter- incidentally, did you see Peter Dench's spread in the Sunday Times on mm-hmm. Sunday? Nope. Uh, a couple Sunday. of Sundays ago. A couple of Sundays ago. It was, yeah, a week last Sunday. Um, he <laughs> went down to the beaches. Did He He, he, he ate Martin Parr, Martin Parr. Did he? Peter Dench. Uh, right. Peter Dench is a great bloke. And um, he's got a wicked sense of humour. And there's some brilliant pictures. He went on the day, uh, he went to Bournemouth, the day it was like nuclear hot. Mm. And he's got some amazing pictures of people with these massive sunburns oh. and pe- like proper, proper fat blokes with all of their clothes on, s- sat on the yeah. beach drinking out of tins of lager. <laughs> And, uh, Classy. Yeah, and it weren't me. I wasn't even there. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Peter the um, Peter Dents, the chap that used to write that? He used to write amazing articles for was it yeah, professional, professional photographer? photographer? Yeah, his writing was superb. He's, he's a uh, very very dry sense of humour. Absolutely, he's one of the only photographers that I think right now is still kind of flying. I, I mean, I really mm. don't know. He may not be flying, but he, I'm seeing his work in lots of places. Oh, yeah. Is uh, he, is he a photojournalist? Yeah. yeah he, okay. he, he will be um, He will be commissioned by an agency for some some stuff. But He used to write very, very uh, eloquently and um, honestly yeah. about um, his mental issues with photography yeah. and stuff as well, didn't he? Yeah. He was probably one of the first photographers, I, I think, in a magazine I'd, I'd read such honesty from. Yeah, I'd, I th- lo- I'd love to interview him. I think that um, he I think he's doing something for the photography show. Is he? So you know the photography show is going online in September. I'd, I'd heard, yeah. So yeah, it's moved. So a, lo- a lot of these events now have now moved online, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. So they're doing a whole string of. Um, it's obviously free. You don't need tickets, but they're doing a whole string of online. It's all happening on two days: twenty twentieth and twenty first September. Yeah. Um, and oh, so all the speakers still doing their their. Not all of them, but some right. of them. Are you? I'm doing one, yeah. Oh, so cool, we'll do brilliant. a we'll do a brilliant. video, and um, and the idea is we'll film it, and they'll present it, and then we have to be online for Q and A after it. But oh, I think so the reason have, why I said that yeah. is because I think Peter Dench is doing one, and is he's, he's one? always worth watching. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What a great idea. Um, do you know when when yours will be on? Or I suppose the the advantage is that you'll be able to chip back in and have a look at them now. My, you, know, you, you, you know, it won't be a case of missing Kev. You'll be able to. I think mine's scheduled for 10 a.m. on the Monday, the 21st. But there'll be, like, re- replays or anything. Presumably, surely. yeah. Uh, presumably. really don't know. But, of course, we will link to the, the photography yeah. show and yeah. you can look. There's the, the, they, they've released everybody. I've already added loads of them to my calendar because I'm like, oh, because I never get to see any of them, you see, at I know, the you, photography yeah. show. Yeah, you'll be able to see them all. I'm always too busy hiding from people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kev. Right, you go first. Questions. Okay, so I've got a question here from James Souls. And he, James Souls again. Are, yeah. we, are we privately mentoring him through? this show friend of the show <laughs> hi jets i have a question that has been asked before but i wondered if options have changed over the last oh, few months right. obviously i've not shot a wedding in four months or so but i've been occupying my time with other photography projects i'm just coming to the end of a doorstep portrait fundraiser i have photographed two local protests with some audio and the chants and speeches and i will hopefully turn them into a photo film we have been busy yeah, yeah. I'm also planning a local street project. Uh, I'm really enjoying this kind of documentary work and that will hopefully ramp it up and expand what I'm doing around the weddings that Mm. pay the bills. Mm. Uh, So two parts to the question. One, should I make a new website to house this kind of work? I have a wedding photography website and could chop that around to house this project as galleries. And number two, in your opinion, would there be any place in the blog on my wedding website for certain aspects of this type of work and then directing people over to a possible new website? 
There you go. Um, I really keep swinging between it being a good idea and a bad idea to have specialist websites when I see so many photographers now with uh, great... So a plethora of work on uh, on a if you want to call it a jack of all trades site, fine, um, which gives you more options, more bites of the cherry when people come to you. But of course, the disadvantage is, and um, I think I'd, I'd always I'd always sort of dined out on the fact when I had clients come to see me that I was a you know a certified um, specialist in in weddings, and they liked that. It was a it was a good mm. thing. I I wonder whether that's uh, as important anymore to people. I mean, I'm I'm a photographer now. I'm you know. I think you, as long as you keep things in context. So, for example, the portraits, the doorstep portraits. I think there's a reasonable that, that thing for work. a blog post on yeah. there. Look what I did. Yeah, I feel a bit squeamish about um, about having, for example, boudoir on a site where you've got pictures of kids and portraits. Yeah, that seems that seems. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think those two sit very well together on the same side. But also, I don't, I don't think that the documentary uh, side of things, such as the protests, yeah. are worth putting on a wedding website. And, and not because the work won't be good. I'm sure it is. If they're in the in their head, they're, they're you know they they've got in their head wedding dresses and cakes and fluffy bunnies and things like that, and then they turn up to a wedding photography website and see. Uh, protests and they're not going to be in the right frame of mind. Fluffy bunnies? Yeah. At a you? wedding? Hey, loads of fluffy bunnies. Easter <laughs> what? weddings? What are you yeah. talking about? Um, but that, So that's that's my kind of take on it. I would, uh, you know, if it's something you're going to be doing more of, James, then set up another website for the documentary stuff. Just keep it relevant. You know, I always think about what 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 the potential clients who are coming to my website are going to be thinking about and looking for. Clearly fluffy bunnies in your case. Fluffy bunnies. Yeah. Easy to photograph. Have you ever been to a wedding where you've had um, uh, the, uh, what are they called, alpacas? <laughs> no, my auntie has alpacas. Though. Does she? Yeah. But well, I don't get on very well with alpacas. They sp- there's something about alpacas and llamas that really dislike me. Oh, and actually it's llamas they have, yeah. Um, just, uh, yeah. What's the point of them? Well, I've, I've seen them. Um, they seem to be popular in um, American weddings seem to have them. So our, our, our American friends can tell me whether um, I'm... I don't understand why. I, well, uh, they've they've become this sort of thing that they carry the rings down the aisle. <laughs> why have a best man when you can have an alpaca? <laughs> and some of them actually dress them up in little tuxedos and stuff. If the chair cover uh, company used to, to <laughs> irritate me for making people spend way more than they needed to and, and so much that they couldn't afford an album anymore... The alpaca handler. <laughs> I'm sorry. Alpacas. <laughs> alpacas. Honestly, somebody what did will su- they think of next? Well, somebody did suggest recently with COVID, of course, um, that people are now beginning to... Well, those that are going to spend money on weddings are going to be thinking, right, what do I need? Do I need... <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I really need an alpaca? You know, I want one, and I've always had my heart set on one. <laughs> but do I need it? What does it? What does it bring? Uh, and will it be there later to mingle with the guests? Oh, <laughs> an alpaca. An alpaca. Oh dear. Alpaca. What will they think of next? I, I honestly thought when you said about <laughs> alpacas at weddings, I thought there might have been some kind of cultural or religious. Have you never seen this? Surely no, you've seen this. I've never seen an alpaca at a wedding. Really? I might have never seen an owl at a wedding either. Well, I have. Well, I, I've done. I've done a few <laughs> weddings now with birds that deliver the, the rings. <laughs> In fact, the I always remember one at one particular venue where they they said to the um, they said to the said to the bride, "Don't don't have." In fact, no, have an owl. That's what that's what she was told. And he, to be fair, it was a decision they both made. So um, so they they were told have an owl because owls behave themselves. Okay, don't have a bird of prey because a bird of prey looks majestic and fantastic. Of course it does, but they they are a little bit prone to you know. I suppose okay. they're like. I suppose if you compare them, the owl would be like the dog that would say, "Yeah, no worries at all. I'll bring it down there for you. Great." And the um, and the bird of prey would be a little bit like, "Yeah, I might." <laughs> like a cat. Yeah. Whatever. 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 Could Whatever. do. Maybe I'll I'll make out that I'm coming down there. Then I'll, as this one did, swoop up into a tree and stay there with the ring. <laughs> and they couldn't get the ring down. Well, maybe that's what you see. That wouldn't happen with an alpaca. No, of course. Gonna, I've never seen a flying alpaca, obviously. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I honestly can't strange. understand. But alpacas have a terrible sort of... Um, they're a bit... I mean, I've always thought of alpacas and llamas as they, they've got a, a bit of an attitude. 
Yeah. And, and can you imagine they that? Spit, I mean, like, they, they, like, I um, did, camels. Like camels, like I think that. they spit, yeah. yeah. And they do, and they are a little bit, little bit humpy. I don't mean literally and physically. But I mean, they're, they're a bit more kind of like, well, oh, no, I know, I just do what I want. I'm an alpaca. <laughs> yeah. And I know that when, I, when I've seen alpacas in the past, they've made a beeline for me. And I've been thinking, whoa, wait a minute. Anyway, I oh. hope that answered your question. Um, why? Here's one from Craig Wilson. Why are people surprised when they see you shooting landscapes? And this is one from our Facebook group. And get the comment, you shoot landscapes with a Fuji? I thought they are street or wedding cameras. Has Fuji been pigeonholed? Oh, interesting. Mm. I mean, I know people don't don't naturally um, gravitate towards Fuji film for say sports work. At, uh, at you know, we've had a few guests on of late that um, that have started using Fuji film cameras for their sports work. Uh, I think I think Fuji film cameras are perfectly capable for that and mm. and, and for landscapes. But yeah, I mean, I don't. I never find myself well, on, a, on a cliff a edge talking to other photographers. Thomas Heaton. Yeah, I mean, he's one of the most well-known uh, landscape yeah. photographers in this country. I, I think generally, actually, it's for, for quite, the YouTube work, right, particularly. Yeah, he is. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because he uses XT3. There's this. You know, this this all comes down to the the kind of um, uh, you know pigeonholing of brands in terms of what what they do. But actually, you know, Nikon, Nikon, whatever you want to call them, Nikon are in a whole world of trouble. <laughs> oh. Canon are rumoured. The rumours are that Canon are not going to release another 5D. They're they're just totally going the mirrorless route. Mm. Uh, this new mirrorless one's supposed to be a beast, though, it's, isn't it's it? It's meant to be yeah. insane. Yeah, yeah. As, as the specs look incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I think that's that's kind of where that's all come from the, the 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 hangover from DSLR to mirrorless and various things like that. So yeah, they are they definitely is brand snobbery. We're totally aware of that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can use it, use whatever you want. That's yeah, what I'd, I always I'd feel, say. I'd feel comfortable using it. Right, yeah. yours. Okay, so this is a uh, fresh email, hot off the press from Marcus Eld, <laughs> right from Sweden. Instagram MC underscore B R U N O A R T. And he says, Hi, thanks for the amazing podler, blah, 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 blah. That's actually what he says. <laughs> right now I'm thinking he about did. how to replace Isn't my. That's Swedish. Uh, pod, blah, 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 blah. Pod, blah, blah, blah. I quite like that. That's nice, isn't it? Pod, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I can see that on a t shirt. <laughs> right now I'm thinking that's, that would look ace on a t shirt. Pod, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Right now I'm thinking of uh, how to replace my eight year old MacBook Pro. Ooh. Do you have any experience of using an iPad Pro instead of a MacBook? What would I miss? Does it cope well with the Fujifilm RAW files? Is it possible to use it together with my external disk? Best regards and hugs from Marcus in Sweden. And hugs. Oh, hugs back to you, Marcus. Um, well, I've never used an uh, iPad Pro, I've, but I've used a MacBook a lot uh, for editing, and I find it um, uh, really easy to use and a, a wonderfully powerful machine for what I need. I mean, you've got an eight-year-old MacBook Pro. I tell you what, your new MacBook Pro is going to slice through your files. Yeah, well, I think he's 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 toying up using an iPad instead. Instead of it, though, uh, isn't yeah. It? yeah. Um, I don't I, know. I mean, I'm I'm still I I've, uh, ooh, I know there's plenty of people that do use iPad Pros now, aren't there? There are plenty of people. That do it and then the new Lightroom um, mobile ecosystem works really really well on I, I don't have an iPad but I know that the, it's the same as the, the mobile instance on an Android uh, and it, it is actually very very good very good Lightroom on a, on a mobile device so you could probably get away with it I guess in terms of in the field shooting and raw files you can obviously have raw files on, on um, iPads these days uh, I think you've got to get funny dongles and things like that to to get the the files into it um but yeah people do do it i know that uh i think andrew billingham says that he only ever uses an ipad for editing doesn't use a computer at all really yeah seems to do him what about your uh, what about your grading and your your color correction yeah i mean i i wasn't really going to go down that route but i i personally wouldn't do it i have to say um i i think ipads pros at least i.e the high-end ones are actually very well calibrated out of the box i believe so you know who knows the fact that it doesn't ch- it wouldn't change the screen won't change on an ipad you won't lose your calibration so that's probably a benefit over yeah. over it shifting over time do you use your uh, i think we, we we touched on this a couple of weeks ago but do you, do you use your um your your fancy what's your one called surface surface book surface book Not I, so, what's the difference between surface pro and surface book surface book is a proper laptop with detachable screen uh, right, that turns into a tablet surface right. pro is is a uh kind of has a plasticky type uh, laptop and it's it's just slightly different right okay. slightly different um power and money basically so yes i do use mine um but i don't use it as a tablet 
so it, I use it as a as a laptop. Right. Um, so it's 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 fine. Right. Okay. Well, I would miss the power of the power of my 128 gigabytes <laughs> of RAM. Now you're boasting. Yeah. Tim helps. Uh, good day, Neil. Good day. Um, uh, we know, do you know the last time we had this, we said uh, we had something that said, "Please don't read out in, a, in an Australian fashion." Let me just check. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, we're okay. Good day, Neil. Good day, Kev. From Tim in Adelaide. Have you ever been to Australia? <laughs> no, but I do have 128 gig of RAM. You do. <laughs> um, questions for consideration. I'm curious to how you curate your images. After a wedding or street walk, how do you decide what's a keeper, what's a deleter? Uh, is it gut reaction alone, or do you apply some predefined rules that you already have to aid the selection process? Mm. Are there some images that have a je ne sais quoi that uh, sees it? <laughs> sounds a bit like, always reminds me of uh, Rodney and Del Boy, that je ne sais quoi. Yeah. The sees it become selected. Do your clients have much input to this process, or do you select what they will see? Let's take um, it as a wedding or portrait photographer first of all. Do you? Would you let your? Would you ever let? I know I wouldn't because um, it just it would be opening a can of worms. Would you ever let your clients choose what what's going to be considered keeper and deleter? No, no, no. Well, and why? I, I don't why? do much portrait stuff, but it might be different for portrait people. Well, I'm kind of I'm kind of using both both here, so it doesn't sound too wedding centric. Yeah, I think. I, <laughs> Mm, I mean, it depends on the shoot, I suppose. If it's an editorial type shot where they, you know, you need to get the processing done quickly and out the door and everything, then they, the clients will need to see them. Uh, if it's a family type thing, typically not purely because they might look at oh, it and go, just, yeah. oh, I look a bit tired or yeah. I don't like my hair or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously you haven't processed them or anything. So, no, I wouldn't. And definitely not at a wedding. No. Just, I just wouldn't. No, I wouldn't even uh, think about that. Because it's just... Uh, it well, what happens when you get those... Spoils the... Well, what about those quest- questions you get afterwards that say, OK, have you got any more? I mean, I, I like them, don't get me wrong, really great, but can you show me the ones that you deleted? I, I've had that a couple of times, but literally two or three times over the years. Um, and I, I just usually... I would just say the same thing as as I did then. It's no. look, you know, I've uh, I I haven't kept anything back. No, you know, if I thought it was anything worth you seeing, yeah, then I'd I would have, just I'd have showed it to you. you. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not in the in the business of keeping things back, uh, and then it just goes away. So, in terms of um, street work, what how about do you decide work? what's a keeper and a deleter and mm. any kind of pre prerequisites? No, I I would, you know, if the picture is important. If it looks important, it doesn't have to be good. We mm. talk about that a lot. We do, yeah. Um, so that's that's usually the, the way that I do wedding stuff. Um, I don't have any kind of, you know, rules of thumb of what's going to be a good picture, what's not. As long as it's as long as I think it's powerful enough, then they, they'll get it. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, does that cover the technical deficiency question as well? I said, if you've taken an image that's out of focus, but the content is great. Do you delete it because of the technical deficiency or, w- or would you keep it because you think, ah, oh, this this is the... Well, it comes back to that moment, doesn't it, really? Yeah, well, there's a difference actually between out of focus and um, maybe a little bit of motion blur or yes. something like that. Yeah, a yeah. picture can be badly out of focus and still have a great moment in it, but it's still going to be bad. It's still not going to be a good picture because yeah. it's clearly a, a mistake. Um, but sometimes you can you know, miss focus on something and actually what you did focus on becomes interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, all of those are, are – they're all in the mix. They're all, they've all got as much chance as the next of being yeah. thrown into the <laughs> Kev bag of love. <laughs> oh, I did wonder what you were going to say there. <laughs> right, should we do some uh, club indulgence? Uh, let me – as always, mine are right at the back of the studio. Do you want to do you want to launch off first? I'll go off. This is from Jonathan Clapton, a friend of the show, and in fact, an ex wedding client of mine. Is he? Yeah, invaluable for anyone starting out. My favourite podcast, and also a great community and network through the Fujicast Facebook group for anyone starting out in photography or thinking of going professional. This is an invaluable listen and resource. Neil and Kevin impart their vast knowledge of the industry on others to learn with real honesty and openness. If you listen to every episode, you will learn loads, confirm things you thought you knew but were afraid to ask, and laugh along the way. I couldn't be without it does jonathan clapton speak as fast as that in real life he sounds like one of those messages you get at the end of an insurance i, I do these quickly because i feel like it's part of the oh is it we're meant to do them all oh, in the a pace, minute the pace the we're pace meant yeah. to do it in a minute. well no it's, it's stretched out really hasn't it now yeah um this one's from uh, whole mark uh, this is hands down one of my faves these two are always good for a laugh great insight always interesting intriguing interviews always listen first thing monday morning really on the drive to work you're straight in there aren't aren't you and wouldn't have it any other way. Keep it up, guys. Okay, this one is from Western Dog. 
Fujicast exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark only recently come across this podcast but it has quickly rocketed to the top of my must list podcast great content for any experience or aspiring photographer the two hosts have a brilliant rapport and a lot of fun to listen to the production value is also top notch keep up the good work you definitely should do those insurance adverts I'm gonna do uh, there I, are people that actually get paid a lot of money for doing those I, when, you, I, yeah. when I was a kid I used to practice doing the horse um, oh, the, uh, cold horse commentary yeah, yeah I, used to, I used to love doing <laughs> it'd that it'd be very good yeah. uh, one from uh, Heli Flyer um, absolutely loving this podcast not gear biased funny and entertaining with interesting topics and truly great audio there we go what well, uh Time for one more. You've got 20 seconds. You'll do it. I know By far the best podcast in the world. By far <laughs> the best photography podcast I've ever listened to. Expertly produced, balanced, informative, and entertainment. I look forward to every episode and almost always come away with some actions. That's from CPR2A. Very good, Kev. Yeah, you've got you've got that in, you've got that job in the uh, the voiceover business. And remember, if you if you send one of these in, thank you very much. And uh, you you are considered. You're our favorite listener, and we mean it. Always right. Time for this week's interview. From time to time, we've been able to have a two-parter and professional photographer Chris Orange has provided us with a first part that dealt with food and commercial work. And then this week, a whole raft of interesting topics, which I found very difficult to edit just into one week's worth. So today, we talk about landscape work, but actually how to go about funding it uh, where it doesn't involve print sales and workshops. There's news of the Wild Weather Project that's already featured on the BBC and one of our favourite subjects. Well, we touch on it anyway. Capture One versus Adobe Lightroom. This is Chris Orange. So we've been talking a lot about mindfulness of late. And you yeah. published a post on this, and you've yeah. only just done it as well. Let, let's yeah. let's start from the beginning, though. You you initially deleted. Am I right here? All your social media accounts. I did. Why? I did. Why? I was, it's funny, really, because for the first year, two first year or two of my business, social media was massively important for me um, in terms of growing it. It really helped me. But after quite a few, after several years, I began to feel like my business wasn't growing through social media. But I was giving it a lot of time thinking that I needed to build um, this big followers base to help me get business. And I began to question the ethos, thinking, what am I doing? I'm investing so much time into something that's that's growing at a reasonable rate. But am I really getting the business you know, from this? I see it very much as a business thing rather than a, a personal thing. And um, I, in the end, got so sick of it. I just thought, I'm just going to delete the whole lot. This was a couple of years ago, and I thought, if I go under, then I know why. <laughs> if I if I don't, then you know I don't I, I can then live without it. And so yeah, that's what I did for. And, um, and and did it dip to start with? No, it didn't. That's that that was the thing. I actually my business just continued. In right. fact, I've, up to the lockdown, I was having such a good year. Um, you know, I was really really pleased with 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 the way that it was going. But I found that there was one ingredient missing that I needed social media for. And that was why I came back to two of my, to Twitter and to um, Instagram. Mm. Um, and that ingredient for me was the ability to communicate with businesses mm. um, on a level that you cannot do through email. What about LinkedIn? Um, yeah, I, no, I, I never went back to that. Right, okay. Um, I just went, I literally, I, I basically ditched Facebook and ditched LinkedIn I ditched them all, and then I just brought back Instagram at first, mm. and then I brought back um, Twitter. And I find Twitter's the best um, of them all for um, communicating with businesses. Now, I'm um, hearing a lot more photographers talk about Twitter in, in yeah. excited fashion, yeah, and a lot more photographers um, drop Facebook. I've yeah. been surprised myself how little engagement uh, that Facebook brings you. And I'm led to believe some of that is um, that if you – if you dare send people away from the the Facebook sphere or wherever it, whatever it's called, that they they don't want to see links. And of course, a lot of the time, um, you might be linking to films or, in my case, podcasts and uh, maybe other YouTube things. But of course, they don't want that, do they? No, exactly. And actually, I found when 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 Facebook and, and Instagram changed the algorithms of a year or two back, or maybe even three years, when when it became that you couldn't just automatically be seen by your followers instantly. You had they had to choose to, to follow you and to see you. And yeah. Otherwise, you get lost in there. Basically, and as soon as you tell Instagram or Facebook you're a business, then you've got to basically pay to be seen. Mm. Um, and I just, I just resented the whole thought of that. I just thought I'm going to spend a fortune, and how do I know if, if at the end of you know this advertising campaign, 
everyone who's clicked this and and might just be people who just randomly clicked it you just don't know that whether there's quality in in that and so for me I, I can only speak for myself for me i just by leaving it firstly it gave me a lot of peace of mind um you know the very reason i got into photography was through landscapes and through the the kind of feeling of being at one with the universe as it were um in that landscape and and for, and social media kind of clashed against that the feeling of having to try and compete and you know compete for the, this kind of pool of people not knowing whether or not it was going to actually give me anything worthwhile anyway um whereas twitter you can just pick any company and you'll find them and you can speak to anyone in any company with a link with a photo um with a few words and you know it's it's so simple and i find the engagement rate through twitter i've got a tiny twitter account i don't do anything to it i've just come back to twitter i've got like 20 people following me right. um and uh i use it completely to 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 speak to business to grow relationships in businesses and um it's already yielding fruit it's amazing I've heard it said that actually people um, from companies are very happy to get a direct message through Twitter. Yeah, very much so. Mm. I had, in fact, one of my one of my landscape um, photography projects that I do. Cause the way that I run my landscape, um, I basically shoot a lot of commercial landscapes. So I'm much more looking to sell my landscapes into the travel industry rather than to um, the general public. Um, and so, but I've sold enormous amounts of work um to um companies through twitter um so you know it's a really good i find it a really effective way of of, of doing business well let's talk talk about landscape because i i mean I, I identify that you have two main passions photographically i could be wrong but i, I feel they are landscapes and food yeah definitely. maybe maybe not in that order i don't know Dep- yeah i think so depends how good the food is on the plate yeah, i suppose exactly and whether you can yeah. eat it at the end um but but um that landscape work is is not renowned for necessarily making photographers money but you no. you you found a hook yeah i think so i think what happened for me was i loved doing landscape shoots I'm, i've got three kids and so the thought of going away for days on end is difficult as you all know so you've got to kind of work out is this worth me going and spending time away from family so i began to feel like as my business grew I can't just keep going away to Iceland and wherever, wherever, getting all these great shots, not having any end product for them. You know, from a business point of view, it was spend and enjoyable, but not actually something that was producing, you know, income for the family. And so I began to think, how can I tailor this project to have an end goal, which in the end would be to make make some money? And there were two ways that I, I did it. One way was to mix my food and drink photography with the landscapes so i would approach big companies and say to them i'm doing a photo shoot in iceland wherever do you want to send me a bunch of bottles or whatever it is that you you know that that company sells and i will photograph them in this landscape and you can buy the buy the shots off me per shot clever and that's been really, really so successful. So are you saying then that you think, right, where where would I like to go, Chris? Well, I would like to go to Iceland. Um, exactly. I'll, yeah. I'll fund the project, but I'll, yeah. I'll on a wing and a prayer, uh, essentially, um, approach some people and, and see if we can fund this thing. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. And I went to a PR company who I knew um, for a certain whiskey brand. And if you go on my website, you'll see... Um, I know the one, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yes, a certain yeah. uh, whiskey company sat on an iceberg. Yeah, I saw and, it. And... Uh, one of my, uh, one of my favourites. Yeah, and they sent me a bunch of bottles. And um, I went over there and I shot them on the icebergs. And I just thought it was a clever thing, kind of on the rocks, but on the ice, yeah. you know, it was all kind of... In my head, I thought it worked well. PR company loved it, and they sent me loads. And I went over there and took a little team. We shot them um, in somewhere called Jokulsalen, somewhere like that. It's basically a, a place where a volcanic beach where the icebergs break off of the glacier and get washed back onto the beach. So you've got about a hundred photographers all photographing the sunrise yeah. with all these different, yeah. you know, ice <laughs> um, icebergs melting. And you with and- your bottles of whiskey. I was there getting washed away um, <laughs> with these whiskey on these icebergs. And uh, yeah, that worked really well. And I've done the same with other whiskey companies in Scotland, with gin companies, with uh, all kinds of different wine um, in different places. And uh, what I found was that would fund my trip so I could then shoot, leave enough time to do the shots that I wanted. 
um, which I could then bring back and then try and sell those photos. Um, the other way I've done it is by um, setting up a project. So I had one called Remote Britain. And the idea was that I would travel to um, as many remote locations around Britain as I could with the idea of photographing the landscape in a way which would attract tourism to those areas because so many remote areas now rely massively mm. on tourism but people don't always go to the very edges they mm. might go to the coast but they may not go to the islands and there's so many islands around britain and you've got dolphins whales you've got puffins all you know incredible things when you're on your own there most of the time anyway so i went set up re the remote britain project traveled around to all those places and um it was amazing because i sold I sold a lot of photos for quite a lot of money mm. to travel companies. It's basically people who are looking to use that, that kind of material. And uh, again, I would fund it by photographing whiskey or whatever, and then take the photos. Um, and uh, it's been very effective. You know, you, you, you just got to think to yourself, yeah. what, what can I, what's, what can the end product be for this? If I do this photo or I go to this place, who would be interested in this, in these photos? and uh, go to them first and say, look, here's some of my work. You can see the kind of thing I can produce. What about if I produce this for you? I'll fund it, but you just buy the pictures off me, you know, the ones that you yeah. want to buy. Yeah. Taking a bit of a risk, but, you know, ultimately, for me, it's paid off. Well, it has. And, and since well, this will dovetail nicely, actually, talking of, of projects, and I'm wondering now, um, knowing this, whether you're doing a similar thing with this project. You might not be. It's, uh, you're you're going around the UK to take some. Uh, well, there's some pretty extreme places. You're capturing, yeah. as and I quote here, the beautiful nature of severe weather in the landscape. Yeah, um, I love severe weather. Mm. I just got this when I did the Remote Britain project. It's come out of of, of Remote Britain, and you, and you're right. It's entirely geared around um, the travel industry, and um, the thought of being in the most severe storms around Britain in wherever that may be and somehow capturing a beauty within that. Um, because obviously everyone loves to go to the, you know, wait for the light to get the best sunsets. And I love doing that and it's beautiful. And I, you know, I, I do a lot of it, but there's something about, and for me, there's something about being the only one left when it's absolutely, you know, 50 mile an hour winds and, and heavy rain, You're the only one left because everyone's gone in by then. And can you now get a great shot? And I love the challenge of that. And uh, yeah, so I, it starts yeah, um, next week and then we um, start in the Lake District. And then over the next few months, we'll be traveling around most of the UK, hmm. capturing as much as we can wherever there's bad weather. I know you said so, we, I, I, that's because your wife Jenny is joining you for much of this. Yeah, she is. Now she's she's in the, she's at the second, end of second year training to be a midwife. Right. So she doesn't have a lot of time, no. but she's going to give some time to come with me and uh, and travel out to some of these places so yeah she's she's kind of she's crazy she should have picked the the, the other project <laughs> it was much more peaceful <laughs> um kit wise it, that is very important because you, you yeah. you've changed from canon to fuji um and yeah. before we talk about the xt3 and being in the wilds with it what was your reason for changing i think i'm one of those people who i loved canon i shot with canon for years and so and i shot with the 50 megapixel in the end and it was brilliant but i think it's like in the end, I, I, the gear's very heavy. You can't get away from that, you know. And when you're in, when you're walking, when you're hiking, especially for long, long distances, I began to get a bit tired of carrying really heavy gear. I was also very attracted by the um, the images that I could see from other people um, with with their Fujis. And so I started with the Fuji XT1 several years ago and ran Canon alongside Fuji and had the full kit of each. And then I sold my Fuji gear went back to Canon. Uh, it was a bit like going into the deep end and then jumping back into the shallow end again. <laughs> and then, um, cause you, when you're, when you're commercial photographer, it's so, so important that you feel your gear can do what you want it to do. Mm. So I was reluctant to let go of the Canon until I knew I had something that could print. At that point, I was doing a lot of like photos that would go onto like shop fronts or, um, or you know, huge prints. So I needed mm. to have the megapixels. And so as soon as Fuji brought out the 26 megapixel, I knew that, I could then get back into Fuji again. But you'd, you'd been shooting with 60. Was 26 going to cut the mustard? Um, with a 50, with the 5 DSR? Yeah. yeah, well, I think, you do, personally, I've not noticed any difference in the files. 50, not uh, 60, sorry. Yeah, yeah. With the 50, yeah. <laughs> I've I, just added 10 50, on for them. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I've actually not noticed any difference in the files. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time in Capture One and Lightroom, um, you know, really trying to, especially in landscapes, you're trying to literally boost all the shadows and whatever and trying to see the quality. And I've, I've just found the, the Fujifilm so impressive mm. in its final result that in the end I was, I was very happy to, um, to sell off the remainder of my Canon gear. Mm. And, and glass wise, what, what do you, what do you take with you? Yeah, I take, well, I've got, um, the 10 to 24, which is obviously the 16 to 35 from Canon. Yeah. Now, um, it's an, it's an, in, an interesting lens, that one, because people have a love hate with that. It's not the finest lens in the world. I personally love it for filming. Um, and it's a, it's a really useful lens to have in the bag, but it, it's, 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 it's first generation stuff. Yeah, I, it's good on a tripod. That's what I find. F11 on a tripod, you know, it does the job. But if I'm shooting the landscape, I'll often shoot with the 23 1.4 um, because it is edge to edge sharp. Um, and I don't always want a massively wide yeah. photo on landscape. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of prefer to pick out something within the scene that is a bit more artistic or something. So I find around about 35 millimeter is a great a landscape um, focal length for me. Um, and also I shoot with the, um, obviously I've got the 56, um, but my, my new favorite lens on Fuji is the 90 millimeter f2 is it okay i pulled it over lockdown right um and uh i just can't believe how sharp that lens is i just i don't know why everyone hasn't got it and i know it's a bit more kind of it's not very street photography because you're a bit more further away and, and mm. all that but if you're shooting a portrait for someone uh a headshot or something there won't be a sharper lens out there no. i cannot believe what well, for for the shots that you um just rewinding back into your yeah. um your food work for, for the portraits that you're shooting of the chefs and then maybe the dishes what what are your uh, what, what are your choices what are your choices of glass there yeah i use either for the food shoots i will use either not the 90 or the 56 right um which obviously 85 and 135 yep, yep. Yeah, right the compression on the lenses for those two are are brilliant and if yeah. you're going for a wider group shots and things then i've got the 23 right um, that i use for that and so and often these kitchens are very they can be quite dark areas or restaurants quite mm -hmm. dark places mm -hmm. Um, so you're looking to shoot, you know, as you need the 1.2 or the 1.4. So you're not packing um, up 50 to 140 when you go out then? No, I don't have any of those lenses. No, interesting. I used to. I used to have the 50 140 and I had the 70 to 200 when it was Canon. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I really want to be as, as inconspicuous and as, you know, um, basically as light as possible in terms of carrying. And, and you don't, don't find where with um, shooting Fuji. I'm going to ask this question because there'll be some people that, that uh, I can almost feel them asking it for me. You, <laughs> you, you don't find that using the Fuji kit, because this is the one thing I had to, and it's interesting because you come from the same place as me, really, Canon mm. into Fuji, that the one thing I was thinking was some of the commercial work I was shooting, I don't shoot as much as you do, clearly, was hmm, what are people going to think when I when I whip this kit out the bag? Yeah, now that used to, I used to think that when I had the X-T1. I used to feel that and that was an issue for me. And I used to take my cannons as well. And sometimes you'd, I'd like even get my cannons out and put them out on the side and then shoot the Fuji just so I felt like people knew I wasn't just turning up with my dad's camera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, now it's not an issue. No. I think gradually people, in fact, now I have people say to me, can't believe how cool or retro your camera yeah. is. You know, where, yeah. where's that from? What is it? Do you shove the um, grips on them or, or, or again, no, are you trying to remain no. as inconspicuous? As you yeah, can no grips. I used yeah. to have the XT1, but for the XT3, no. no grips. I just bought five or six batteries. But again, the battery life's amazing now. Yeah. I did a whole shoot the other day, a whole day shoot of food, um, tethered to my laptop, and uh, battery was brilliant. Lasted ages and ages. Now I know you've been trying out Capture One. Um, yeah. I, I keep looking at Capture One and thinking, well, oh, maybe I should have a go. And then I think, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm comfortable with Lightroom. And then I find a million and one, a million and one excuses why Capture One won't do what I think. Um, it needs to do, but you've um, you've been getting on fine with it, haven't you? Yeah, and no, I actually have both. All right, you use both. Is there a reason? Well, the reason is because at the moment you cannot tether from the XT3 either or any Fuji camera, as far as I know, um, directly to um, Lightroom, and so it's just one of those things that hasn't quite yet happened. So the only way to tether for food photography um, is to use Capture One. So I began to get into Capture One and kind of work out, you know, whether this was going to be a good way forward for me. And actually what I've found is, is that because of the way the system works with Capture One, if you are using one of the Fujifilm simulations, 
it will carry it on the raw file if you want it to into Capture One. So you can actually, it saves you a lot of time. So if you're shooting an event and you want to use, you know, Astia or whatever, you can shoot it all raw and then Capture One will process all of that. So on the raw file, so it will show the um, the preset or the, you know, film simulation on the file um, it, straight away. So it saves you a lot of hassle in terms of your editing time, but mm. you've still got all the benefits of a raw file. So I've, I've been really interested in, in shooting um, food and interiors that way. Now, post-COVID, I know it's yeah. a little early, of course, to say post with any great deal of confidence, <laughs> but um, I keep my fingers crossed. How, how will you as a photographer tackle this time, market your business? Uh, what, what's I mean, it's a lot, probably a lot to answer on this one, but what, what's going to change? What's going to have to change? Well, for me, during the lockdown, I tried to stay in contact with my clients as much as I could. Um, so um, back when I came back to social media, I, I actually let all of my clients know that I was back on social media, invited them to follow me to keep up with my work. So they regularly see what I'm producing um, anyway. So there was kind of a, a link there. Um, I kept in contact. I mean, like anyone, you know, I had o- over the space of two days, I lost every booking for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, so for a while it was thinking, what, you know, how on earth are we going to move forward? But now, um, like for this week, my diary is completely full. Um, and the food industry has suddenly woken up yeah. and, uh, I'm, I'm back to, you know, I'm, I'm back to almost pre lockdown levels wow. in terms of my, my, my diary. Yeah. Um, there's lots of gaps still, but you know, I am seeing a lot of bookings now. And this is pre Christmas. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're working, you're back in the saddle now. Yeah. I'm wow. back now. I'm, yes. I wasn't back about a month ago and then shoots that were cancelled suddenly as soon as, I think as soon as everyone knew that the, the kind of food industry was coming back. Everyone began to think we need new menu shoots. We need, you know, um, dishes to market. We need, you know, everything to start to to kind of get people coming back into our restaurants, etc. Mm. So I found um, people who probably wouldn't have even done shoots before are beginning to think, you know, we need um, some food photography. Mm. So that the food industry has really come back. Um, interior industry is beginning to come back, um, and we'll just see, you know, how that kind of goes forward over over the summer. Um, and I think it's just like anyone, I've redone my website about four times <laughs> and <laughs> um, made sure my social media was all right and homeschooled my kids. Um, but I did also do, yeah, during the lockdown, I did some other manual labor to try and make some cash as well. Right. So I went to, um, a friend of mine's got a vintage car workshop and he needed some floors scrubbing, getting the oil off these floors before they were, and, and then painted. So I did that for him for a few days to try and make some cash. Hmm. And um, I did a few other things like um, I suddenly learned, like everyone learned to do streaming. So I ran streaming for a charity and then I built a website for a charity. Um, I just basically thought, what else can I do yeah. that makes cash in the meantime? And so I literally just did as, as many things as I could to make money. Photography is now back to being the, um, the main thing again. Good. Okay. You said homeschooling. What's, yeah. your, what's your best subject? Oh my goodness! It's not math. <laughs> I found that. I don't understand. Every anymore. time, every time my ten-year-old came at me with, me with a maths question, I'd divert and walk the other side of the house. <laughs> Seriously, in the end, I was like, "Let's bake something." <laughs> um, yeah. But, Who wants oh, to make pancakes? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or Egyptian flatbread. We learned that on BBC Bite Size. Made that for so many days. Yeah. Um, yeah. My kids are much cleverer than I am, and. Uh, my, my my oldest, who's twelve, she was pretty self sufficient with her school, and they kept sending her things. My the eight and ten year old needed us, and so that was like, you know, trying to find ways to win them on BBC Bite Size. So I'm glad it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> now, thanks to Chris Orange this week. It's been nice to chat to him across a couple of weeks actually about his business and all manner of stuff, including his new wild weather project, and of course touching on food photography last week. Now, to that extent. I'm just about to record a longer form pure business of food interview with Chris. Everything you want from technical through to to the creativity of it, which I'll be featuring on Photography Daily, which is my solo podcast in the, the near future. And while I have your ears, now that you've listened here today to our fine podcast, myself and Kev, this week coming up on Photography Daily, there's uh, a strong lineup. We've uh, the very respected British photojournalist Edmund Terracopian and what he feels about press censorship. And believe me, he does not pull any punches. 
It's a first of a three-parter as well. And on Tuesday, we're very honoured to have Pulitzer Prize winner Carl McNaughton. He's been on this show as well. He's coming back in there to talk about a delicate subject, winning awards for stories of plight. And there's uh, a story to come with that one, uh, an historical one of a picture that was taken in uh, Colombia by uh, Franck Fournier, the French photographer. Plus also Steve Jones, a professional commercial negotiator, the first non-photographer to, to appear. But, but if you're wondering how to deal with pricing inquiries at this time and how to tackle the discount subject, the D word, is worth a listen. Uh, available on all your favourite podcast apps and online at photographydaily.show. Right, back to your questions. Before we do that, though, um, I forgot to mention right at the start of the show, it's your birthday, Kev. Congratulations. Yay. There we go. Made another one. Made it through to another year. Another chicken. <laughs> what a great year it's been as well. Yeah, it's this is one to really celebrate, superb. isn't it? Superb. Yeah. yeah. Enjoyed every single second. Yeah, yeah. It. Um, it was a big changes for you. You gave up and you became, I haven't got a sound effect for a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> oh no there is an advert on telly called kevin the carrot as well at is christmas there? time isn't kevin there the carrot? kevin the carrot well, kevin the gerbil i, I lived through kevin the gerbil only yeah. to get through to middle age and then they brought it kevin, kevin the, the carrot. bloody carrot can you imagine that well i don't know what would have been worse being kevin the gerbil at school or kevin the carrot i don't know although anyway, kevin the Ke- does kevin the carrot have a have a voice uh kevin the carrot does have a voice oh, what's, yeah. oh you must right. have seen it at christmas I don't time i really kevin haven't seen kevin the carrot I don't watch a lot of telly, honestly. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> funny enough, though, it's on an advert for Sprouts. <laughs> is it? <laughs> what, Kevin the Carrot? Yeah. Are you sure you saw this? Yeah, I think yeah. So. All right. Um, we also need to do something very, very, very important. Today, it being your birthday, because that's the way we remembered it, <laughs> it's the uh, it's it's time to announce the winner for the tour box. Um, now, first of all, uh, tell us what the tour box is again. So, the tour box is a, a little device you plug into your computer, mm-hmm. and it's, it's again, it's hard to describe it uh, without you seeing it. You have to go to the website to see it, and it's a um, what what you might traditionally be called a MIDI controller for yeah. Lightroom. So it has uh, sliders and dials and panels and buttons, and you you attribute them to things like exposure or move next, move left. Are there enough buttons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've used it, and it, uh, it takes a little bit of time to get your brain into into action. Yeah. But once you've got it, it's good. And what I like about it, what I like about the toolbox most is the none of it is pre-programmed. So all of the buttons you can assign yourself, there's a software interface to it. So you can say, I like the button on the left, for example, I use to um, move forward. Yeah, out of the box, I think it's used for something else. So I use it, I tap it. Oh, you've reprogrammed it. on to the next, right, bu- okay. next button. Yeah. Um, the main dial I use for exposure, up and down. And, you know, if you use a... Um, uh, a tablet, a Wacom tablet, or something like that, well, along with one of these, you needn't go to your mouse or your keyboard. I think uh, I think it's a, a great little thing. And so we did run this uh, little competition. The um, the good folks at Toolbox have a have a Toolbox to give to you. Yes. And um, if you don't win this, you can of course go to the website under the Toolbox bit, fujicast.co.uk under the Toolbox bit, and click on the link. And there is a discount there. Just waiting specially for Fujicast listeners. And okay, we are. We love you all. And we asked you to do what? We asked you to send in a picture yeah. that describes or best describes your exit from lockdown Mm. and it was a bit of a slow drab at the beginning but in the end we had 20,000 entries (laughs) and out of those 35,000 we we managed to what would be your picture by the way of um, oh you you did say actually it would be it would be the empties there were a few empties that came in actually yeah (laughs) yeah there's some very interesting pictures some very entertaining very humorous yes Uh, some quite emotional And uh, yeah, yeah and, so. right. Well, we we've uh, we had a we had a production meeting uh, involving an awful lot of yes. And uh, the winner that we've chosen, which was very difficult, considering the amazing um, pictures that you you sent in, some really inventive ones as well. And I feel almost uh, tempted, Kev, that we should put maybe some of these up on the site as well. But the winner is Jenna J E N N A. Um, entering on behalf of my husband, in brackets, he took the photo, obviously. All will become clear when you see the picture, of course, on the website. But this was definitely our son's escape from lockdown, having been born on June the 5th. Picture taken by John Taylor. It's of, of the birth. Um, yeah, um, we just thought really, really inventive. And it is 
the perfect escape uh, from from lockdown. So well done, you've won yourself a tour box. Yep, I think that was a that was a great picture, and uh, well done to them. Worthy winner, worthy winner. We um, shall uh, be in touch. I shall email you with uh, uh, your well, with uh, the stuff. <laughs> the stuff. I'll e- email you. I, I'm rubbish at this. We've got to get better at the competition. I, I'll I'm email still- you, and then I will uh, put you in touch with the tour box people. I'm still waiting for my my one. Still isn't in the. No, definitely not in the cupboard. No, yeah. that, that cupboard's bare. It is. It's still, it does have your 35mm, of oh, course, stuffed oh, in the corner, oh, oh, oh. to be fair. Right, let's go back to, to your questions. OK, so this one is from the Facebook group. We put a call out for more questions on the Facebook group, and you delivered. Mike Wharton um, from Australia. Oh, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> and it says, uh, this would be a question for Kevin. Uh, this is why I'm reading it out. Right. When using his uh, presets, is the result going to be any way different based on the film simulation used in camera? So this is about the black and white film presets that I released. And the answer is yes, if you apply them to a JPEG. However, they're really these are really designed for RAW files. And if you're using them against a RAW file, then no. The, the presets, uh, anything you set in the camera in terms of JPEG settings are not applied to raw files at all so things like shadows highlights film simulation all of that kind of stuff mm-hmm. does not come into uh into question with the raw files so no is the answer if you're using raw yes is the answer if you're using jpeg yeah have you have you um <laughs> sold any more of those of, of late people yeah. still Couple. slow trickle slow trickle good it's good it's good that's nice fed the family for a month yeah and they're still on uh you can get them on the um on get them on ministry of shadows ministry of shadows that's right. his yeah. workshops yeah. all those places oh we've had some new stories in ministry of shadows of late yeah it's really really good really nice one from ian palmer yeah i liked um have you got a load sort of in in reserve now it, i've got a few yeah, yeah but of course um uh, anybody so the ministry of shadows for those of you who still uh, have not seen it is a black and white website for black and white work yeah um, strangely it's <laughs> although it's built by me and it's got a lot of my pictures in the gallery and stuff i really want it to be a submission you know community type thing so yeah. feel free to submit and get the work up there and especially if you've got no other place for showing your work and you fancy it and there are no there's no criteria there's no boundaries on t- uh, quality and all that kind of stuff it's it's purely for people to enjoy the medium mm. good Irene Robertson, um, there was a picture here. They went out. Um, mm. It's not so much a question, but I just wonder, I wanted to bring it up to see what you, what you felt. This was, uh, she went in with her daughter to, to go shopping for a wedding dress. Mm. And uh, let, let me just read out what, what she said. Um, everything had been halted over the last few months. We finally got the chance to embark on um, a, a shop for the wedding dress. Uh, she's in London, I'm in Scotland. It's been difficult to get together, but uh, we did a, a secure a couple of much sought-after appointments. Bring your mask and gloves, we were told. Only one other person, and you must wait outside until the assistant greets you. You'll have your temperature taken on arrival. Can you imagine that, having your temperature taken? Mm. And, uh, you know, going into a shop. I mean, I, It's I'm, like living in a sci-fi world, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's a post-apocalyptic which is a word I usually have trouble with. Mm. Um, I'm taking your seat, which is marked out. Your seat's marked out with yellow lines that you must not cross. There'll be no food, no drinks, and only the bride can, can touch the dress. You mustn't touch any other items in the shop. Alas, we were unsuccessful at finding the dress on that occasion, so we'll have to do it all over again. Such a pity that all the fun has been sucked out of the experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel dreadfully sorry for for the you know people who are planning on getting married at the moment yeah. because yeah. it is it should be you know the eighteen months leading up to your wedding should be where you're bristling with excitement. The fun starts, and, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's just it's sad, very sad. Um, however, I did uh, the the picture that Irene took. I thought was yeah iconic. It, it was of our time. Yeah, wasn't it? absolutely. Yeah. Her her daughter uh, in her you know trying on a wedding dress with a mask on. Yeah. Uh, really nice picture. Um, you know, so yeah, it's is, it's <coughs> it, isn't it? Basically, yeah. Well, right. One from Russell Goff Wood. Um, I would like to ask how you guys manage metering. I like spot metering in the right situation, but then I like to have face detect on at times, which seems to disable spot metering. I find myself constantly switching metering modes and then constantly turning face detect on and off. There must be a better way to set it and forget it. Go on then. <laughs> you know that these aren't my my questions. I love that. Send me a sound one. Uh, yeah. So the face detection and, me- and spot motion aren't going to work hand in hand because uh, the nature of it means that the the um, focus point is going to be darting all over the place, which depends on where the eye and face is. So the spot metering, you can tether it to the focus point um, on Fujifilm cameras. 
uh, uh, typically I just use spot metering for everything, but the the key thing is divorcing the focus and the metering. That's the big challenge for most people because what right. you often not often but sometimes what you're focusing on is not necessarily what you want the metering to be mm. so you might want to focus on uh somebody's eye but actually take the meter reading from the cheek or something like that okay. no remember with metering it's only going to work if you're in one or more of the automatic modes so your camera needs to be in aperture priority shutter priority um or p mode effectively a a a a a a um I love it. I love spot metering, but you must try and get used to using it, using back button focusing, focus with the AFL button and meter with the half depressor, the shutter button. That's probably the way you're going to get the most out of it. It takes a little bit of practice. Um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't make sense that it's going to be working accurately with face detection. Um, I don't really use face detection, though. I have Do you to not? Say. No. Not at all? Face as in face, not yeah. face as in face. Yeah, face. F A C E. Yeah, face. Yeah. yeah. Phase. So you do phase, you, phase. Why don't you use it? It'd be really useful for stuff like recessionals and I don't I pro, don't know. Processionals. Maybe, maybe this goes back to when when we never had it and mm. then when we did have it it wasn't very good. Yeah. And now it is much better. Lots of people use it. I just I just never use it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't I I don't know, I always fear I remember when I used to shoot with my Canon cameras, um now this we're going way back two thousand and nine, ten time. Yeah. They didn't have face detection, but they had something called AI servo, which is the continuous oh, yes, focus. Yes. Um, and then they had this, I don't know what they... Was that good? I can't remember. I didn't use it. It was reasonable, but it had this very, it had this, and again, remember, we're talking 10 years ago. I'm 100% sure the Canon cameras are better than that now. Mm. Uh, it had this tendency to just suddenly decide to nip off into the into the congregation and focus yeah. on somebody's face that was miles away mm. so i think i kind of went off went off that kind of technology then um i was talking to somebody the other day about the late late well the, the latest generation canon film camera that used to have the retina um focus so you could move your eye around and it would follow you and, and focus on what you wanted it to focus on which was oh like, on yeah. the photographer's eye yes Ah, yeah, but I mean, it. it I don't think. Uh, I think it's, it's technology. I mean, it's old technology, but it wasn't wasn't really brought forward into DSLRs. No, but you did that. Great idea, but also I, I was thinking, what a great idea! Why doesn't somebody use that? But of course, no, because you want to scan an image. It's never going to work, is no. it? No, yeah, exactly. It's it's far too power intensive. Uh, I can see that being used in like for, for forensic stuff or uh, you know high end yeah. kind of military photography or something. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it probably is in that kind of stuff. We just yeah, don't yeah. know about it. Yeah, but not. They don't tell us everything. Uh, right, okay, book. Now this looks, I mean, last week's was great, but this this is... Um, this is this is great, isn't Alan it? Alain Labois. Labois. If, if not a little bit coffee stained on the in, back, sadly. sadly. Yeah. Alain Labois. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. French photographer. He's a friend of yours. <laughs> uh, so I first discovered Alan, Alain, sorry, Alain Labois. Uh, I first discovered his work years and years and years and years ago, and he's he's made a living out of it now. But back in the day, it was basically just uh, snapshots. Seems to be the wrong word to use, but yeah. snapshots of everyday life of his family. And now he he has the uh, lovely predicament that he is um, living in the middle of France, in very rurally, yeah. and his kids have. And he's got. I think this this book was before he had his last his latest child yeah. um so his kids basically run around do whatever they want they swing in on trees they play with the cats and there there's some beautiful pictures of the kids my, the my, pianos my and, mum would have said this is feral behavior <laughs> well uh, that's definitely not the word i would use however no, i'm no, looking at the picture at on page 45 that is feral behavior and it's the two little girls they're both uh i mean it's artistic there's, there's nothing crude about this whatsoever no. but they're, they're both um uh unclothed but they uh they are covered in ink where they are drawing oh, on each God, other yeah. um and those those pens look like semi-permanent markers to me <laughs> um do you know i funny enough i did a uh, i did a, a photography session family photography session where it was encouraged that they draw over each other it wasn't my idea but it worked quite well actually yeah uh, well the thing it was is, quite it good gives fun them, gives them something to do isn't yeah it? yeah and so all uh, of until one of them came forward and tried to draw on the camera oh. i drew i drew a line at that moment <laughs> all, all of uh, look at that picture. All of Alain's 
um, oh, pictures just are look at these like driven like yeah. driven through the soul with emotion wow um, blimey and I think he shoots with Leica. I think he's a Leica shooter. Yeah. Um, so is, would this all be uh, manually focused Leica work? I or? don't know. I don't know. I think it's digital. So yeah. whether he's us- using well, yeah. M9s, M10s, I, I really don't know. If it was an M8, of course it would be, wouldn't it? Could it be would M8. be manual, manual. Uh, it could be film, M6, yeah. maybe. Who knows? However, the, the editing, the reason why I think it's digital is because the editing is beautiful and very, yes. very crisp and yes. consistent. Yes. Uh, so I don't. There's no words in this book. Apart, well, there are some words at the back. There's a kind of description about the uh, the family and stuff, but there's nothing to describe the images. Um, but there's some beautiful ones. You know, mum and the baby sleeping. There's a, an insanely wonderful picture on page 21, mm-hmm. and it's a picture of Alain's wife and one of the little ones, probably a two year old, perhaps maybe a little bit younger. Yeah. And Alain, Alain's wife is heavily pregnant in yeah. the shower. Yeah. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, there's no kind of editorial look to this. This is warts and all, proper, yeah, yeah. beautiful, powerful, emotional it's photography. It's incredible family work. I mean, the legacy he's yeah, produced through this. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. I mean, you've done. Let me just. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna suggest to you, Kev, that you've done a lot of work like this with your kids. I, I, Maybe not volumes of it. I mean, he has been absolute. Well, no, you've been prolific. What am I talking about? I would say that look at I that, look at that image there with a the deer. Yeah. So this is the one. Whoa. That, this is the uh, probably the most iconic image of Alan's at the beginning, at least page twenty nine. Uh, one of his daughters uh, lying down in the in the kind of fetal position, if you like. Yeah. And there's a baby fawn, um, just kind of approaching her, and it's. Is yeah. that for real? Is that happening in real time? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. It's oh, so, incredible picture. So beautiful. Yeah. Um, and the finishing, the editing, everything about it is beautiful. And every single one of these pictures is something you can put on the wall and see happily in a gallery. Yeah, and they have every, been every single one. They have been done. I think yeah. the Leica Academy. What's that one there? A lot of stuff. This one. <laughs> it's like I, d- I keep glancing over this one because I don't like it. Do you not? This is a chicken's head in a glass, in a cup. I thought it looked weird from upside down. It looks even weirder the right way up. Yeah, so they've obviously just... Um, they've just they've just said to... Bock uh, chicken, look the other way. I know. Shh. They've just said to Charlie Chicken, come on, come on into the house. We're just going to... Uh, yeah, make a, make a pie out of you. Yeah. yeah. But that's it. This, you know, it re- is real life. They this, live this on a farm. This is country living, isn't they it? They live on a farm. Yeah. That's what they're, yeah, yeah. they're going to do. This one's God, if you, I mean, if you well. lived on a farm, you'd have... Uh, what's this Page one? 61. So <laughs> mum is there working on her laptop oh. uh, in the, in the in, you know in the dining in, in the room. corner yeah and there's a, there's it, somebody that's hooked up to the ceiling that seems to be swinging backwards and forwards yeah they got a swing in the another living room. child heading out into another room you got the sofa there with some oh. balloons and everything it's just this does not make you want to go and live in France and yeah just, yeah <laughs> I, I would and and you know it's it it saddens me a bit because I you know I like to think that I played my part in documenting my kids you did I much think, more than I did I don't yeah. think I did it. Oh God! Uh, it, well, I certainly didn't do it as well as this. That's for sure, hundred yeah, percent sure. Yeah. I didn't do it as much. Well, look, either. Um, I know uh, they're growing up, and you know. no, I know, but they're, but they're, they're, it's a new chapter, isn't it? Um, quite literally, a new, a new chapter. Different, what about the teenage it? years? Yeah, I know. You know what? I got the other day. I got my Jeff X out, and I got yeah. my flash, and yeah. I got a background, and and I turned into the thing that I, I never wanted to be. Yeah. Um, and I took some really nice portraits of Rosa, and but of course she looks at them now, and she's like, oh. Oh, don't put that on Instagram, you know. And, yes. I'm, and I'm like, yeah. <sighs> do you think Albie Gemma, would do we now? We need to have another baby, Gem. What? <laughs> we can keep it in a cupboard <laughs> oh, okay. or a drawer. Uh, it does make you want to have more kids just for the photography, doesn't it? it does. well, it's too late for me. Doctor Two Bricks has already met me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, did I ever tell you about that visit? Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't want to know about it either. So that's Alan Lebois. Um At the Edge of the World is the name of the book. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. it does have a publisher on the back. K e h r e r. But however, you will be able to find it on his website. Alan A l a i n l a b o i l e. Beautiful book. If you're into family photography, and you've never heard of him. Was uh, you should be punished <laughs> was that self-published by the way Sorry. I, I well i originally thought it was but mm. it does have a publisher on the back oh, okay but it, i did buy it directly from him uh, from his website yeah, so yeah, yeah. and i know there's been multiple volumes now so right. amazing photographer oh that's i think of uh, well you bring him amazing books all the time but that is probably one of my favorite books you've ever brought in uh, uh, i can't believe i've never stolen that from you like your 35 millimeter <laughs> <laughs> right i think we've got time for two more questions we're gonna have to think of a new feature by the way because the disaster story having gone 
Although Eddie, Eddie Michael, uh, Michael did send in a, a brilliant disaster story. I've got it here in my hands, mm. but I'm going to save it to another day. So let's have a question. What are you going for? Uh, this one is from uh, Ralu Chase. Friend uh, of the show. Friend well, of the show. Yes. Good old Ralu. I really need to clean the sensor of my X-T3. Ooh. Can you recommend me a cleaning kit? Didn't uh, we, we have a question like that this before. Where I said, get your soap. Uh, yeah. and, a, and a sponge run it, the tap. run it under the tap and you're sorted I, my answer Ralu honestly is uh, people do it but I would never clean a sensor myself I just send it off send it out uh, Fuji, uh, Ralu's in the UK so she can use yeah. FPS Fujifilm Professional Services we will link to it of course uh, if you're a professional photographer and you've got supporting gear you can mm. um, they'll do a couple of free services I think in the first year or something like that um, they'll clean it have you ever used those sticky pads no that seems horrible. Well, yeah, they were. I mean, they're not sticky, sticky, but they're they're just they're, they they worked really, really well. Um, it comes in a it's like a tin, like a first aid um, first aid kit tin box, and and inside um, you've got these these pads, and they're they're a little they're sticky on the underside, so you just go and just on the sensor. Mm-hmm. I, don't know I can that. see you looking horrified at that I idea. That. Anyway, worked. I only shoot at f1.2, so you never see any dirt on my lenses. <laughs> yeah, yours look disgusting <laughs> if you go any higher. Um, right, um, I think we've got time for one more. And you, you've got all the questions, actually. So, yeah, come on. okay, so this one's from uh, Martin Wilder. Yep. He says, hi, Kev, hi, Neil. Thanks for the photo advice you bring every week. Just catching up with all the lockdown episodes and have a question following some episodes about street photography. Mm. It's something I want to do more in the coming months now people are venturing out of the houses again. The question is more one of permission. What's legal? Oh, well, this question could be, this mark. Could, this could be a long time. Secondly, in terms of portrait work, how do you go about asking for permission? All yeah. the best, Martin. Yeah. Well, I mean, when it comes to asking for permission, we've had quite a few people of of, um, of late that I've spoken to on, on this podcast and also on the, on the uh, Photography Daily that have been talking about how they approach strangers. And, and mm. actually, it seems to be... Um, you know, there's a very straightforward approach of saying, can I make your portrait? Yeah. It seems, seems to work very well. Don't wrap it up with great long communication where they say, all right, well, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it on Instagram. Then I might use it on Facebook because that straight away is, whoa, warning signs. No, thanks. I'm moving on. Yeah. Uh, just say, you know, some, sometimes it can be as simple as, as just saying something nice, you know, saying, look, that's a great hat. Yeah. I, need, I need to grab your portrait. Is that possible? I oh, think, go on then, mate. No worries at all. I think the portrait thing is is um, is far easier because in terms of permission because you do have to ask them. Yes. Um, you know, I wouldn't even be uh, adverse to standing there with a camera on a tripod and a sign next to me that says, uh, let me take your portrait. <laughs> you know, you see people standing in Trafalgar Square saying yeah. free hugs. You know, and they stand there with their arms out, and then I'll people tell you what, the for a hug. Bottoms fallen out of that industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've gone. Yeah, uh, free hugs. Yeah. Um, so, but then, on in terms of street, what's legal? Well, it depends entirely on well, mostly on where you are physically in the world. Different permissions, different countries. Um, typically in the Let, UK, let's just take it here. Yeah. Typically in the UK, if they're in a public place, you can take pictures of them doing whatever anything they're doing. Um, what about minors? You can take pictures of anybody doing anything. You can even take pictures of the police, uh, right. unless they're doing. There's some technical stuff like counter terrorism or something. Right, yeah. um, however, what's ethical is very different. Yes, so, I was going to say there's there's a difference between what you can and what's ethical. Yeah, that's. I, mean, I, I'm, that's what you I need feel to very about. awkward taking. Uh, well, I would feel very awkward making pictures of, of kids on the street. Well, making pictures of kids just because they're kids or because, you know, they, know, they, they got a nice hat on or something, that yeah. would be very awkward. Yes. However, if it's if it's a bunch of kids, I don't know, playing in a fountain and it, the light is beautiful and it's a wide yeah. scene or something, I wouldn't have a problem with that no. as, as such. Um, but, yes, taking a picture of a child, for example, yeah. not illegal, yeah. but... You know, I you, you I would draw the lines certainly. On on, on um, the Photography Daily show, we had somebody that was uh, talking about uh, a photographer that were charged, literally charged up to them. Bang! Got a picture. Then then just ran across the other side of the street, did the same thing to an old lady walking in the other direction. An old sorry, not an old lady, an older lady, mm-hmm. a venerable older lady, mm. well, and which which actually he said quite disturbed her, and I can understand why. Yeah, uh, but again, not illegal. And, uh, you know, people people like Bruce Gildin, to a certain extent, Doogie Wallace in the UK, yeah. uh, although I don't think Doogie is, is kind of the, the runoff type photographer, but mm. um, Bruce Gildin's made his mark yeah. um, by doing that kind of thing. And, and he'll shout them down in the street if they say, oh, and he'll say, well, I can take what I want, thanks very much. Exactly. And the thing, well, I mean, Bruce, if you, read, if you watch the interviews with him, he, you know, 
he, he openly says, I have no ethics. You know, and if you haven't got any ethics, you're going to get some great pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not what. That's not the professional <laughs> advice we're giving you here. Yeah. No, yeah. So draw the line. I, I mean, I'll, when I do my street photography workshops, I just say to people, look, you draw the line at your own personal ethics, your boundaries. Yeah. I would not take a picture of anything that I would not feel comfortable being in that picture myself. Right. Okay. That's it. Right. That's my my line of it. This is a long old subject. We've talked about it before, but yeah. if you then start using the images on like magazine covers for, or not magazine covers but advertising oh, do you a then product. have to have their permission if it's advertising a product mm. and things like that then it becomes a but if it's bit more editorial different. you don't know do you not if it's no, editorial no. or journalistic no. or you know even just a gallery or even in a book yeah. it doesn't need to it you don't need it but It'd be a bit of a surprise if you go into a gallery and you find yourself in there oh there's a picture of me yeah but that must happen all the time yeah mustn't it you know i mean how many we're, we're i bring in books every week that are yeah. Uh, yeah. street photography books yeah. and we yeah. all we all cluck over them and go these is beautiful look at all these pictures and yet actually we're, we're it's they, in 20 years time there'll be no books like that because the, well you keep saying the, this but but we but it's, correct police will yeah, have yeah but it's still legal to take it's still legal to take and make stuff isn't it yeah but more and more people are, are, are you know why would you let somebody take it you shouldn't take you should only yeah. take a picture if people uh, everybody in the in the scene knows that you're taking a picture and i'm like hang on a second they're all signed <laughs> yeah and they're all signed and i'm like well, well hang on what happens when you're on holiday and you take a picture yeah. of your family on the beach what about all those people in the go background? get 100 signatures go down marbella beach when there's ten thousand brits you know, yeah. you're, gonna, you're not going to get all of their their signatures either. No, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, thank you very much for all your questions this week. Now, do you know, um, we have been doing this show for uh, it's about 389 episodes now, 1,578 episodes. And it is my 11 And it is your 11 yeah. What are you doing, by the way, to celebrate tonight? Um, <laughs> just staying in. Are you, are you going out anywhere? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, but you will be having a few of these, though, won't you? Definitely. It's my first birthday in the UK since... Oh, God, yes, usually you're in, in Spain. Ten years, aren't you? I yeah. think, yeah. Oh, dear, don't mention the war. Oh, mm. no, you're, I mean, I know you're upset about that. You'll be, the, you'll be back there next year, Kev. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I will. This will all be sorted by then. When you're older. Yeah, when, when you're, you're wiser. Old, yeah. When you're fatter. <laughs> when you're more miserable. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, dear. Happy birthday, Tom. Oh, happy birthday. Hope you have a great evening. <laughs> and that's it for this week. <laughs> Uh, and I feel terrible because right at the start of the show we didn't say it's your birthday Kev I just went into that piece about you being in a hot tub with Dodgy Dave <laughs> yeah why Dave <laughs> I know I just know him as Dodgy Dave <laughs> but uh, anyway well you, you could do that you could do you, you and the boys in the hot tub could do I could, hey. get, could get Naughty Norman in Naughty, no- <laughs> Naughty Norman Naughty Norman lives three doors away he's 84 is he yeah lives oh. by himself he used to live with his brother but his brother died why is no, he called Naughty a- Norman I don't, I don't oh, want to know uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a long story man. moving on well, that's it. Thank you very much. If you've liked this week's sh- uh, this week's shows, and if you can uh, and you, you feel it's appropriate, and then leave uh, a review for us in Apple Podcasts or somewhere. It doesn't. It does us an awful lot of good. You would not believe how much it does. And we, uh, of course, we read out those reviews as they as they come in too in the um, in the club indulgence. If you can share the episode on Twitter or Facebook, you're an absolute star. Thank you very much. See you in the Facebook group for any questions that you may have about today's show. Oh, yeah, the point that I was making of having done 5,894 episodes now is that uh, we really need you to keep the questions coming in. Oh, I used yeah. to say they are the lifeblood of the show, and they definitely are the lifeblood of the show. Send them in to click at fujicast.co.uk. And they don't just have to be about spot metering or Fujifilm cameras or anything they no. can be about anything yes oh yeah anything and, yeah don't don't be thinking that you have to make it a Fuji question it can be about anything photographic and we'll even have a go at, or, uh, not. Uh, or, or, or not yeah they business. can be personal yes they can be stuff business yes anything you like click at fujicast.co.uk or you can uh, you can pop them in the, uh, the the private Facebook group you'll find a post at the top music from Blue Wednesday supporting music from the incredible artlist.io and uh, we'll see you Next week on the show, bye bye. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Oh, Naughty Norma. The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.